has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. everyone. Welcome to Unapologetic. I'm so excited today because I'm my friend Shannon Bream with us. She is the author of two New York Times bestselling books. She's the anchor of Fox News at Night, and she's the chief legal correspondent for Fox News Channel. She's covered landmark cases at the Supreme Court and heated political campaigns and policy battles from the White House to Capitol Hill. We are so excited to have Shannon with us today. Hey, Shannon. Thanks for joining us. Julia, thank you. I'm so excited to be with you in person. I know. So I didn't tell you this because uh, I was waiting until we were actually recording, but you not only were the first guest for Unapologetic yes. a year ago, you're now the first returning guest. Okay. So you, I yes, love it. So you are very, very special to us. But we talked about your book last time. We talked about Women of the Bible Speak, and we're going to talk today about your newest book, which is Mothers and Daughters mm -hmm. of the Bible Speak. But before we do that, I want to start out asking you. What we're asking this season, we're talking about relationships. What do you wish Christians understood about relationships? You know, I, I would say that we have to be truly vulnerable. I think it's hard sometimes. Um, we all have the Instagram idea of life or of Facebook or Twitter or whatever our social media platform is. I think we want people to feel like we're doing great, everything's together, and meaning in our spiritual lives too, that we're not struggling. It's easier to post a verse probably than it is to say, gosh, I'm having a really hard time with X, Y, Z, and I need people to come around me or to give me advice in this. Mm -hmm. So I think vulnerability is something that takes effort. It takes time to really spend time with people people and get to that level with them. Um, but the investment, I think, is so worth it. Why do you think we're scared to be vulnerable? I think it's hard. We, Like I said, we want to look like we have it together, but all of us are, to some extent, a mess on the inside. I mean, God is constantly refining and taking us on our journey to hopefully mature, mature spiritually. But we all have things that come into life that we aren't expecting, whether it's um, an illness or a loss of a loved one or mm -hmm. of our job or whatever it is. Um, and I think sometimes it's difficult to show people that we're hurting and what's really going on. But I know in my life, the times that I've opened up and where I've really been in the most pain and really needed someone to come alongside me, it's in that moment that people are more than willing to reach into that pain and to be there with you and to feel privileged in a way that they can share in it with you. So you're obviously in the public eye and very active on social media. What is the balance? How do you balance how to be vulnerable and how to maybe what to share and not mm -hmm. to share online? Mm -hmm. I do think twice about everything that I post. Um, sometimes I think I'm funny and it's not really that funny. Um, <laughs> but then you're like, I'm posting it for myself. Yes, I'm making myself, <laughs> I'm cracking great. myself up. I'm giving myself the laughing face emoji, even if nobody else yeah. thinks it's funny. Um, but I do think twice about things because you never know what other people are going through or how they're going to react act to something. Mm -hmm. um, I did not grow up Catholic. I'm Protestant, but I love the idea of Lent. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of do a social media cleanse during mm -hmm. Lent and getting out of some of the real time-wasting nitty-gritty of it, because I think um, it can be a great tool, but we can't let it overtake what we're trying to do with mm -hmm. the message. So I really try to be smart about it and take a break when I feel like it's taking up too much energy and creating anxiety in mm -hmm. some ways. So I like taking my break, but somehow by the next Lent, I'm always back on it. And so I have to find a good balance for that. That's interesting you say that because I was reading through my spiritual journal and I was like, wait, this time last year, I was also fasting right. from something else. And I don't know. It's just interesting. I think as Protestants, sometimes we aren't super aware of mm -hmm. those traditions and haven't mm -hmm. grown up with them, but they're definitely value. Right. I've embraced it yes. now because I feel yes. like anytime that can refocus us, mm -hmm. especially leading into the Holy Week and, mm -hmm. and Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and then the joy of Easter and what that is. Mm -hmm. But I think to take a minute and step back from things and all of the noise and to think about what Christ actually did, the decisions he made, the sacrifice mm -hmm. that he made, um, I think it's good for us to sit in that. And when we're distracted, it's harder to make time for that. For sure. And we're going to talk more about uh, mothers and daughters of the Bible speak and how we're actually recording this on Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. But before we get into all that, we talked about this for a second. So I told you I was going to ask you this. 
I want you, I want our listeners to hear you explain why it's important, especially as moms and as parents, to watch the news, mm-hmm. to know what's going on, to be informed, even when a lot of us want to stick our heads in the sand right now. Mm-hmm. And it's hard because there are very difficult things, <clears throat> excuse me, that are going on, especially you think the war in Ukraine and how do you mm-hmm. talk to your children about that. Even as an adult, those images are very um, difficult to digest. Mm-hmm. But I do think awareness is very important. However you can digest it or get your information, whatever amount you can take, I do think we have a duty as Christians to be informed. And certainly as mamas, you want to know what's going on in your kid's school and in their lives. Mm-hmm. And what I've seen over the last couple of years is we've seen this huge new wave of parental awareness and involvement in what's going on. Mm-hmm. And um, it's awakened a lot of things. I think for parents to say, all right, when I send my kids off to school, I think the vast majority of teachers love love their children and want to pour into them. My mom was a teacher for Mm -hmm. decades, Mm -hmm. so I know how hard that job is. Mm -hmm. But I think parents also have a new interest in the curriculum and what's happening with their kids, what their kids are learning. Is it in conflict with what you hope to instill them with or teach them at home? Mm -hmm. Or does it spark conversations that you need to have as a parent to say, well, let's walk through this issue um, that's difficult, but it's it's a parent's place to guide you in that. So I think that um, we've seen such an awakening of parents the last couple of years to get a lot more involved, maybe because their kids were schooling remotely and they saw more of the teachers and the curriculum and what was going on. But I think just the world in general, I think um, you want to have an awareness of current events and be able to digest them and filter them to your children in a way that you feel like is age appropriate for them or that they can handle. Um, But yeah, I think we, you know, you have to decide how much of a diet of it you can take in your life, um, but at least a basic awareness. Right. So I noticed that you talked a lot about Esther in mm-hmm. your book, and that's one of your favorite stories that you wrote about. There's se- there's several things with that. Through this year, when I've been just tempted a little bit to get anxious about what's going mm-hmm. on or raising kids and culture, um, God really encouraged me through, no, for such a time as this. Yeah. We're here for such a time as this. Acts is very clear. God put us where we are in this boundary, in this place. And so it's exciting when you realize, oh, I'm not here by accident. I'm actually called for this time and culture. Mm -hmm. And so can you just speak to that? Like how did God use Esther? And then also you talked about spiritual parents, which Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure if everyone's aware of just that idea of having spiritual parents. Yeah, so I wanted to talk about, obviously we have the bonds of um, mothers and children and fathers and their kids. Um, Not everybody's going to be a parent, but you can be a spiritual parent or a mentor. And I've had those people in my life. And I think about Mordecai who took Esther in. He's a relative who, when her parents died and she was orphaned, he raised her. And we think about how much courage and um, confidence he must have instilled her with because she ends up on this amazing journey to becoming the queen of Persia. And she was there for such a time as this because she was Jewish and had in many ways sort of hidden her identity from even the king who had married her. (laughs) And so when a threat comes to the Jewish people. Mordecai finds out about it. That's how she's informed of it. And I think it's important to remember in Esther's story too, there was a bit of hesitation with her when Mordecai wanted her to go to the king. But in those days, if she went without being requested by him, she could have been killed on the spot. There was a bit of hesitation with her. And he said those famous lines, but this could have been that God placed you here for such a time as this. And don't think that you'll be safe if you don't intercede and somebody doesn't save the Jewish people. And she said to him, have everybody fast for three days. And I and my people here in the palace will will fast for three days. So I love that she is reaching out um, for that guidance, that clarity, that extra strength that she needed. And she found the courage um, that she needed to go in and make her case and make her plea to save the Jewish people. And she was placed at that perfect place and at that perfect time. And you're right. God orchestrates every bit of our lives. And some of it, um, as your father preached in the last sermon I heard from him, is we may not understand this side of heaven, but he's always weaving and working. And so whatever assignment he has us on for whatever season, um, to be able to embrace that and know that he's fully aware and involved in our stories. Mm -hmm. And Esther's a perfect example of that. I think something I really appreciate about this book and about what you've done through it with this ministry is... I know from a counseling standpoint, a lot of times when we talk about families, when we talk about Christian families, a considerable number of people <laughs> are like, this does not apply to me. Like, mm-hmm. I did not grow up with Christian parents. Right. I mean, I did. But a lot mm-hmm. of people did not grow up with Christian parents, or they do have family secrets, or they have trauma, and they're like, I mean, this is a nice thought, but 
that doesn't mm-hmm. really apply to me. And really, a lot of times they don't necessarily have an understanding of what's actually in the Bible, mm-hmm. which is not these perfect stories. Mm-hmm. It's actually families that did have Christians and did have non-Christians or did have people that followed God and didn't. Can you just speak to like why did you include the stories mm-hmm. that are painful and mm-hmm. really how that helps us? Mm-hmm. I, I think that, like I always say, if if God only worked through perfect people, no flaws, Jesus would be the only character in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> that would be over really quickly. Yeah. Um, but I love that he does include these stories of flawed families because all of us have some level of dysfunction or tension at some point in our families. So I like that it's not sanitized in the Bible. He tells us good and bad, messes and faithful, it's all mixed in there. And I think we can learn from that, obviously from the strong and the faithful and courageous, yeah. but also the ones that were a mess, that God can redeem all of that. He can work yeah. through all of that. And I did include some of the tougher stories in this book that you don't really hear about in Sunday school or that you don't talk about, um, because I'm hoping it'll spark a conversation. There's a reason God included these stories in the Bible. And I hope that we all take encouragement and hope from the fact that he does work through the flaws and the bad decisions and everything else that can all be redeemed in his purpose and used for his good. And so um, I think he points us to a lot of lessons we can learn through the good and the bad. And um, and hopefully people will see a little bit of themselves in some of these stories. Okay. What's your favorite little known story? Mm. You know what? There are a couple of smaller um, miracle stories that I shared that I remember hearing them growing up, but you didn't get a, I didn't get a lot of exposition on them. Yeah. But I think about Elijah and, and the fact that he, I wanted to include the story um, of some of the smaller miracles that yeah. are in the Bible about where there was a terrible famine in the land. There was judgment on the land. Mm-hmm. And during this time, um, he was told to go visit a certain place and there would be a widow there that was going to help him. Mm-hmm. So he goes and he happens upon this woman and she's gathering sticks. Actually, he finds out what this is about. But he says to her, could you get me something to eat? And she says, yes. And as she's walking away, he asks, oh, and could you get me something to drink? Those things are in such hot demand and and not a lot of supply at that time. But she's faithful. And she says, sure, I'll go do that for you. And she says, actually, I was going to make a final meal for my son and I. Mm -hmm. And I'm gathering these twigs and I'm going to make that. And then that's it. We're going to eat it and die. I mean, that's how dire the situation was. But she was faithful and going to do this. And what happened was the flour and the oil that she had for that last meal that she faithfully gave and made for Elijah then went on through the entire famine. It never ran dry. And she and her son had the provision for that entire time. And that was prompted by her faithfulness and her willingness to step out and do that for him, Mm -hmm. knowing that was all that she had left, at least by earthly standards. But God proved there was much more to come for her. I think what's interesting with that story is a lot of us can just feel overwhelmed with, okay, so what am I supposed to do? (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. there's all these causes. There are all these ministries. There are all these people hurting. What am I supposed to do? What Mm -hmm. is my calling? And I think just even with that story, well, what has God called you to do in your sphere of influence? And so I want to spend some time talking about that. Because we don't have to look far to know women are kind of wondering, where is my place in mm-hmm. culture and church and leadership and your family? Mm-hmm. Definitely so many conversations around that. Mm-hmm. Do you have just, I mean, you're so successful. So many of us admire you. Do you just have, I mean, I know you do, but quick advice for how women can find their calling and their purpose. I always think about the story of Martha and Mary and how they both were doing good things, how Martha's waiting on everyone as Jesus is teaching in their home, but Mary is there learning at his feet. And Martha obviously gets a little flustered about this, like, why don't you tell her to help me? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, you know, she's chosen the better thing. Not that serving people and the hospitality that Martha was providing wasn't a good thing, Mm -hmm. but God had said, Jesus had said, the most important thing is that Mary is there learning at my feet. And I think when we feel overwhelmed by all the things that we feel an obligation to do, at the heart of it is that our time with the Lord and in spending um, time at his feet, essentially, yeah. is what will guide us and equip us for whatever he does want us to do. I do think we have to listen to his promptings. I think good counsel from more mature Christians has always been helpful in my life, too. Um, but I think that he guides us. I mean, there are times that there were doors slam shut in my face that I thought, whoa, that's really what I thought my path was going to be. And that stings and it hurts and I'm I'm humbled and I'm frustrated. Mm-hmm. Or periods of waiting and patience where you're thinking, God, where are you in this? What does this mean? But there's always been purpose in each in each phase, in each season, even if it at the time was very frustrating. So he's opened doors I never thought would open too. So um, I believe that when we're trying to 
spend that time at his feet and be in his word and be with him, he will guide us. Right. He's not trying to hide from us. Right. I think, you know, understanding and remembering his character, he wants to be found. Mm-hmm. He's not playing hide and seek. Exactly. So he's of... not like, I'm here to trick <laughs> yes. you and you'll never figure right. this out. He's waiting right. right there for us. So let's switch gears a little bit because it's Palm Sunday and you're here at First Baptist Dallas and you were interviewed by my dad who is in the studio audience. You by have the a way. studio audience I do. today. This is the first time studio <laughs> audience with my mom and dad and other members of our staff. So that's really exciting. Hey, Dad. Uh, and <laughs> my Mom, husband's here. Hello. Hey, show. And Yes, and <laughs> Shannon's husband. Um, but Palm Sunday, of course, we're entering Holy Week. I want to spend some time talking about Mary because a lot of times the conversation stops with the donkey and the pregnancy that mm-hmm. we're all glad that we didn't have to go through in the manger. Mm-hmm. And we're just kind of like, good job, Mary. And yes, definite kind of, hats off. Kind of, so we just kind of stopped yeah. there, though. Mm-hmm. And so you talk more about her story. And mm-hmm. as we're, of course, um, celebrating Good Friday and Easter. Can you just mm-hmm. spend some time talking about Mary? Yeah, there's more to her that if we really spend time and dig around, we see her with Jesus' ministry. But even before that, when he was very young, you know, in the middle of the night, God comes and warns Joseph, um, King Herod, this evil ruler is going to try to come and kill Jesus. You have to leave right now. Mm -hmm. And so they pick up and they take off uh, into Egypt and they're, you know, this desert trip, no friends, no family, whatever they could literally grab in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. They went faithfully following God's command, but they're refugees and they are in a new land that is strange to them. They're running for their lives. I keep seeing these parallels with the Ukrainian women who are so brave and picking up their families and guarding their children and running from a crazy, you know, killer, essentially, um, that God was aware of that journey with Mary and Joseph. He's aware of what is happening today and that struggle. Um, But I think about Mary, too, that we see her when Jesus stays behind in the temple and she can't find him for three days. (laughs) What mom wouldn't be freaking out? (laughs) Right. I mean, that's every mom's had that moment. Um, But for three days and to think that he was so Mm -hmm. calm and said, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? And she's there through the miracles in his ministry, but there at the cross. Mm -hmm. And so we see that fully realized picture of adult. Mother Mary there at the at the cross, not shying away when they were all in danger who were associated with Jesus, and not shying away from the enormous heartbreak and pain it must have been to watch her son be wrongfully accused and tortured and killed. Mm-hmm. That is every mother's worst nightmare. Yeah. And then beyond that, after the resurrection, we see her again uh, in the upper room with those faithful seeds and disciples of the church, the earliest church. She's there, we're told in prayer with them. Mm-hmm. So Mary wasn't just that um, very willing, devout young teenager with this divine, miraculous assignment, but we can see through her full life of motherhood how she's faithful all the way up up to the end and beyond. Yes, absolutely. I think you would agree with me that there's a lot of conversation right now about parenting and mm-hmm. what, I don't know if it's always been that way. We, I was taught when I was in training as a therapist that that's kind of a newer thing mm-hmm. of wanting to be a good parent and understanding what's going on in, in family systems and all of that kind of stuff. But You're our expert. Oh, well, I'm not going <laughs> to, no, I'm not going to get into all that. But I actually, I saw that you talk about how people say, well, you just need to have faith. And I was listening to, we were listening to a story in the car and they were saying something, have faith, have faith. And my toddler daughter yelled in the back, have faith in what? And that <laughs> Out was of the a, mouths of babes. Was like, have faith in what? Mm-hmm. And I just want you to encourage moms, spend mm-hmm. some time with our listeners about why we got to go one step further. Mm-hmm. It's not just have faith, it's have faith in Jesus Mm -hmm. and teaching those Christian Mm -hmm. principles. Why, why really that's the best parent Mm -hmm. parenting strategy. Right. And the, and the most beautiful, demanding, important job that somebody could have. I think about my mom that we had a tough time when I was little, Uh, my parents divorced. And so Mm -hmm. it was the two of us. And I think about her at being, you know, like 24, 25 years old with a little kid by herself. I think, oh my goodness, you take it for granted when you're, you know, living through it. But I think now about her faithfulness and she was a baby Christian then and growing in her faith, but she's modeled it for me over and over again so that when we didn't have anything, she was still willing to reach out to other people that she thought were in an even worse position than us to share food or a, our car, which was a clunker that broke down all the time, <laughs> or gas money. I mean, she just was such a giving person, the real um, literal hands and feet of Christ. So my mom was modeling it all the time in life. I would see her pray. Um, I would see her at all hours of the day and night on her knees and praying. 
and trusting God for what we needed at every moment. But she was also verbally, you know, helping me memorize scripture and explaining things to me and praying over me. And so just pouring into me in all of these practical ways, um, not that I never saw her lose her temper with me or any of those real mom things that happen, um, but she was always faithful to point me back to Christ through her actions and through her words and deeds and really spend time making sure that I understood scripture, not that it was just some feel good thing that we did on Sundays, but that I needed to make a personal commitment to Christ as a young woman myself and um, surrender to him, accept him as my savior. Um, so she was just always very consistent and faithful. Um, and you know, if she messed up to, to be the one to apologize to me, I was usually the one getting the spankings though. I'm certainly not giving them. And the worst part of all was when I knew a spanking was coming. I don't yes, know if people even spank worst. anymore. Um, I don't know if that's okay anymore, but I've got plenty of them growing up. Um, but it would be that you go to your room and think about this mm -hmm. and then we're going to talk about it. And then there's going to be the spanking. I'm like, can we just fast forward <laughs> to the spanking? Because I don't want to think about it. I want to talk about it. But she wanted to make sure that I understood um, mm -hmm. my actions and my consequences for my actions and, and why she wanted me to learn the deeper lessons of discipline and um, being selfless. And she's the greatest role model that I could have possibly had for that in motherhood. And she was so young. I know. That's so amazing. When I think about it now, like, oh my goodness, could I even balance my checkbook when I was 24? <laughs> like, she's on her own with a child oh, and, and a teacher, I mean, yeah. with a demanding schedule of her own. And somehow, um, by the grace of God, she would say, you know, we made it through that period. Gosh, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to, since we're talking about mothers and daughters speaking, I just want to share this story since my mom is in the studio audience. I recently ran into an old friend and we'd been friends since we were five and we were just talking and she said, what I remember most about your mom is she would always, it would always be really obvious what she was doing, but we would be in the back seat during carpool and mm -hmm. my mom would start witnessing to my friends. Aww. And she, my friend was just saying, I just so clearly remember that because I didn't have that in my family uh -huh. and your mom was always bringing up salvation and how to accept Christ. And so mom's listening, even in the carpool line. Yes. Even you probably need Jesus most young, then. <laughs> even if, you know, really, though, it's those, those life moments mm -hmm. where you can teach those lessons, which is just so incredible. I am so excited about your book. I, of course, as a mother and daughter and <laughs> in Christian ministry, just think it's so important. And I love how balanced you are in talking about these things, um, but still being very biblical and theologically sound. So thank mm -hmm. you for doing that. I want you to tell us how we can stay connected to what you're doing. I know mm -hmm. you have a podcast and show mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. of course, social media. So how yes. can we have more Shannon? Okay, when Lent <laughs> is over and yeah. you're back on social media, <laughs> at Shannon Bream on Twitter and Insta and Facebook, it's all there. Um, if you see a fake count, let me know. <laughs> is that I, I will not ask you for money on any of these outlets. Just know that's not me. Oh, I know. That's uh, so weird. Isn't that strange? Yeah, like bizarre. Shannon Bream is reaching out to you on Instagram mm -hmm. to loan her money. I report my I'm dad not like every day. <laughs> do that. I know. It's not going to happen. Um, yeah. So Fox News at night is Monday through Friday. It is 12 o'clock Eastern. And so for you uh, late night um, night owls out there, I'm there with you. I pop around a lot of other places doing, um, you know, filling in on Fox News Sunday coming up. Uh, I cover the Supreme Court. So that keeps me busy during the day. And Live in the Bream is the podcast wherever you like to get your podcast. Um, so yeah, I am out there and about. And the books are anywhere that you buy books. Um, Amazon or anywhere else you can find them. Target, Walmart. I love when people send me pictures from the airport or wherever it is. Yeah. It's always fun to see it out there. And, and I hope maybe somebody who wouldn't pick up the Bible, mm -hmm. but would say, hmm, I'm kind of curious about that mm -hmm. and don't know about these stories would be surprised to find there in the Bible, but it might be easier for them and less intimidating than picking up yeah. First Kings, you know, right. and trying to read for themselves. So hopefully the books will encourage them Absolutely. in that way. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness and your ministry. And we love watching you on Fox. So. Thank you. <laughs> thank and you and I will look us. forward to maybe one day being back for a third time. Yes. Un unapologetic. Absolutely. That would be great. Thank mm -hmm. you, Shannon. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to Unapologetic. Remember that you can watch today's episode and more at ptv.org slash Julia and wherever you get your podcasts.